Um, yeah, thank you very much, Jen. So I am going to give you folks a little bit of a fire hose of data here. So I, I hope that you're up for that. Um, I'm going to talk about what your priorities for sustainability should be. Basically, if you could invent anything in the world, where would you do the most good? Or if you could start a new business, or if you could innovate some industry, where would you do the most good? And um, what I'm going to do here is not just make a list, but actually derive for you from the raw data, uh, and this is why it's going to be a fire hose of information, there will be uh, lots of graphs and things that will go by very quickly. Um, don't worry too much. Uh, you can always watch this video again, and, um, and I can also make it a little PDF of the slides. So uh, getting into it, the biggest problems in terms of uh, what are the impacts are uh, generally agreed upon as climate change, species extinction, resource depletion, pollution, overpopulation, and social injustice. But what's causing these problems? Is it, uh, is it the paper bag at the grocery store versus a plastic bag, or is it how you get to the store? So uh, climate change, the biggest impact here, this is data from the US, I'll show world data in a minute, but uh, most of the greenhouse gas emissions are CO2, and if you look at the middle column here, the uses that are causing those are, um, the top one here is road travel, that's actually mostly transportation of people, not stuff. Um, but then the next two here are residential and commercial buildings, and if you put the two of those together, they're actually the biggest single contributor to greenhouse gases in the U.S. And then there's various manufacturing industries. Uh, the chemical industry here is big. Cement, steel, and paper are also significant. And then down at the bottom is agriculture in purple. Uh, you'll see livestock and, and manure, that's sort of the, the methane that you hear about from cows, but actually a bigger impact is nitrous oxide offgassing from soil. When you till the soil, it emits nitrous oxide. And so that's actually a bigger impact than, than methane from livestock. And uh, looking at world data, the energy use is a smaller factor, and the, the really big factor here becomes land use change, which is mostly cutting down forests to make food. And, and then agriculture itself is a much bigger, bigger impact as well. Again, agricultural soils are very big, and, and livestock as well. And so what does this mean? It means that the biggest sources of climate change are buildings and transport of people and food and agriculture. Electricity generation is what's causing the impacts of the building industry, and um, it's also relevant to transport because of electric cars. And then some other industries are also very big, chemicals, cement, steel, and paper. So I would also argue that if you want to fix any of these industries, not any, but if you want to fix buildings and transportation, you should also look at cities because cities that are dense and, um, and efficiently laid out fix both buildings and transportation at the same time because a large apartment complex can use about half the energy per person as a single family home. Even for an average construction apartment complex versus a really high efficiency single family home. It's just more efficient to um, have most of the other walls at the same temperature because there's another person living on the, on the other side of that wall rather than the outside hot air or cold air of the climate that you're living in. And same thing with transportation. Uh, dense cities make walking and biking and public transit viable both economically and just practically uh, where it's they're just not viable if you live in sprawling suburbs. So that's why cities are the top way to fix climate change. And some good examples of this, um, right here we have uh, a dense urban block, and it doesn't need to be a skyscraper. Actually, most of Europe 
is already dense enough. Uh, the average European has about half the environmental impact per person as the average American, just because of the dense cities that you folks live in. Uh, and so, you know, like five-story row houses are fine. Uh, it doesn't have to be these, these towering concrete blocks. Um, but speaking of concrete, uh, next is Calera, a form of concrete that actually sequesters carbon during its manufacture rather than giving it off. Below that is one of many electric cars. Everybody loves electric cars. Um, and then over on, on this side here is a power plant from a company called All Power Labs that uses gasification and biochar of agricultural waste to create what they say is actually a carbon negative fuel. Or on the upper left here, this used to be my commute. It was about 10 feet from the bed to the desk. And so this is to illustrate that you don't have to be a, an engineer in the transportation industry. You don't have to build physical things. You don't have to build buildings or cities to, uh, to fix these industries. You, as software people, can have a very big impact by yourself. Uh, because their interfaces and technology for video conferencing and sharing files and things like that can make working from home more viable. Or for city design, um, this website up here is called WalkScore, and it does what you might say, you might think, it calculates the walkability of any address that you type in type in any address in the US and I think some other countries as well and it's a way that you as software or web UX people can help to provide the tools for better city design or better infrastructure design and below that is a user interface where someone was trying to replace paper by making digital interfaces more intuitive and more tactile. So again, you don't have to be in the paper industry to fix the paper industry. And finally, over here, we have building energy modeling software. You don't have to be an architect or a building engineer to fix the building industry. Actually, those people need way better tools for designing good buildings. They need better analytics to predict the energy use, and they need better interfaces for the analytics that do exist so that uh, you don't need to be a PhD in order to operate the software, but anyone can do it. Okay, so that was it for priorities for climate change. Then priorities for species extinction are, uh, they're, they're sort of simpler. Um, this is a chart of threats to biodiversity where the rows are different kinds of biomes, you know, forest, uh, dry lands, marine, etc. And then the columns are the different kinds of threats being faced. And the, the red boxes are the biggest threats, and the arrows are how fast those threats are increasing. So the, the one with the most red boxes here, the one with the greatest threats, is habitat change. That is basically land use change, again, deforestation and other conversion of wild lands to farmlands. Uh, a little bit of it is from urban sprawl, but uh, over 90% of it is from agriculture. Uh, and then the next one, the next most damaging one, is pollution, mostly from nitrogen and phosphorus, and those are generally from fertilizers from agriculture. Next one is over-exploitation, that is over-fishing, over-farming, over-harvesting, uh, over again, mostly agriculture. Invasive species, uh, that is, again, mostly from agriculture coming in and bringing new species to a location. So I think you're probably seeing a trend here. Uh, the only thing on this chart that is not related to agriculture is climate change. And so if you want to fit, fix species extinction, it's, it's really all about fixing food systems by making them land efficient and by having them generate less pollution. And, uh, and then we'll, we'll also see resource depletion and climate change we already saw. So what are some solutions people are doing? Well, um, over 
here we have a massive scale hydroponic farming uh, called vertical farming. And this is still pretty theoretical, but even ordinary hydroponic farms today are the most land efficient form of agriculture on the planet. In fact, uh, just for lettuce, you can grow about 17 times as much lettuce per unit of area of land as you can uh, in, in normal outside fields uh, with hydroponics. And you can make hydroponics even more efficient with aquaponics up here. So this is where you combine fish farming and hydroponics together in uh, a closed loop system. And that also helps to avoid overfishing, obviously. And then down below here, we have more simple low-tech urban farming. There's a lot of unused land in cities that could be used for growing food. And so that's it for, um, for species extinction. Then if you want to fix resource depletion, what should you work on? Well, if you look at water consumption, uh, you might think that efficient showers are the way to go. Actually, that's totally irrelevant. Um, pretty much all of the water that you ever see yourself using, all your toilets and showers and sinks, that's about 8% of your water use, whereas 22% of your water use is embodied in the products that you buy, the chair you're sitting in, the computer that you're watching this video through. And 70% of your water use is for irrigating crops. And crop irrigation is really inefficient. Half of that water is wasted before it ever gets to the crops. So uh, if you care about water consumption, work on efficient irrigation. And also work on uh, different choices for what's on the menu. So beef is by far the most water consumptive uh, form of food. It's, it uses about 15,000 liters of water to make one kilo of beef on your plate. That's about five times as much as a kilo of chicken, 10 times as much as a kilo of wheat. And if you look at resources more generally, uh, minerals, uh, uh, trees and, and other agricultural or forest products, metals, etc. This is a chart of U.S. material usage over the last hundred years. You can see how much it's increased. Um, and the biggest chunk here, this yellow part of the bar, is crushed stone, sand, and gravel. Did you know that three quarters of your material use by weight was crushed stone, sand, and gravel? What are you using all that for? Um, you are using that for concrete in roads and buildings. And then the next one, the blue, is industrial minerals. Uh, that's also partly buildings like drywall, uh, and it's agriculture and the chemical industry. The purple and pink are metals. Uh, those are mostly cars and appliances and buildings. Then the yellow is uh, non-renewable organics, like plastics. And then the bottom one, agricultural and forest products, that's, again, wood for buildings and paper and, uh, and other stuff. And then there's rare minerals. Uh, for example, indium here is used in LCD screens that probably all of you are watching this through. Uh, depending on who you ask, there's, uh, there's only a few years, maybe a decade left of indium in the Earth's crust before we run out or have to use different materials. And there are a lot of other rare minerals here as well. Uh, the electronics industry is a big culprit, as are um, some other chemical industries. Um, but there's good news here as well. Lots of rare minerals are already highly recycled, like lead here. Uh, almost three quarters of the lead in the economy is already recycled. We just need to get that to 100% for everything. So for resource depletion, the biggest culprits are buildings, transport of people, again, the concrete used in roads and bridges and things, um, and, uh, and food, especially meat, and, and then chemical industry, paper industry, electronics, some others. And again, I would say cities are the top priority here because they can fix buildings and transportation at the same time. Uh, dense cities 
make buildings have fewer resources per person because you're sharing most of the walls with other people. And uh, transportation of people becomes more resource, resource efficient because you just need fewer roads. You have more people per area of road. And uh, what are good things that people are doing? Well, up here, this is uh, a building material and it's called Kirei board. It's out, out of Japan and it's made of waste fiber from sorghum farming. So it's agricultural waste, but pressed together, it makes this quite beautiful texture for uh, uh, countertops or uh, cabinetry, stuff like that. Over here, the company Method has been making 100% of their bottles out of recycled plastic for many years now. And down below here, um, the gold mining company Noranda, they discovered in the 80s that there was 17 times as much gold in e-waste as there was in the ore that they were digging up from their mines. And so they became an e-waste recycler. They're actually one of the world's biggest e-waste recyclers uh, because it's profitable for them. And then finally over here, this is not a real beef burger. This is an Impossible Foods burger, which is, uh, um, it apparently is the most realistic tasting uh, beef substitute and it's made entirely from plants. Okay, so pollution. Uh, this guy fishing here, you might think that all the plastic bottles in the water are the biggest problem, but actually that's not the biggest problem. The biggest problem that kills fish in water is pollution from agriculture. Um, it's pesticides and fertilizers. And then to treatments plants, industrial just discharges from uh, various manufacturing industries. and. Um, uh, yeah, and that's, those are the biggest sources for water pollution. For air pollution, uh, the biggest one is electricity generation, mostly coal-fired power plants, and then highway vehicles, uh, skipping miscellaneous off-highway vehicles, and uh, so, so transportation is a big source of air pollution. And then going down further, you'll see solvent utilization and more fuel combustion for manufacturing industries. Uh, etc. And if you look at solid waste, this is another one like water where all the waste that you ever see, all the landfill that you put out from your house or your business, that's all municipal waste. Uh, as big or bigger is construction and demolition waste. So it's important to recycle paper, uh, but it's even more important to recycle buildings. And then industrial waste, that's from manufacturing. Special waste is from mining. So that is all the waste from the resources that go into building your laptop and your chair and your building, et cetera. And, and then this slice here is just from the coal power industry. Uh, toxic chemicals get complicated, so I'm gonna sort of blow past this, but uh, but the most common exposure routes, if you look at all these, are uh, dietary sources or um, uh, contaminated food and water from uh, water pollution and air pollution and uh, indoor air quality, mostly from solvents and paints. Uh, those, are the, those are the main things. And so combining all these, we again see this big three repeating again food and agriculture, buildings, transport of people, uh, electricity generation. And then here specifically, the chemicals in question are mostly solvents like paint and adhesives, and then electronics and plastics again. So what are some good things that people are doing? Well, this is a circuit board here where the instead of being made on fiberglass, it is made of chicken feathers and soy plastic. Uh, made into a composite that is just as strong and that, ha and that is just as electrically insulating. And over here, we have another circuit board where the traces are made not of copper or any other metal, but are conductive carbon ink. And it's inkjet printed, so there's zero waste. 
Uh, so that's uh, a wonderful uh, way to reduce impacts of electronics. You could, in theory, combine these and maybe even make compostable circuit boards. Um, that's a ways off, but it's a, a, a great vision for the future. Uh, if you want to fix solvents um, and paints, this is paint made out of milk. And uh, it's actually a more than 100-year-old technology, but it still works today. And so it replaces toxic solvents with actual milk. And over here is an alternative to plastic called Zelfo. And it's a cellulose uh, composite, basically. And it's just pressed and heated, uh, basically, waste wood fiber that becomes this structural and beautiful material. OK, so that was it for pollution. And if you want to fix overpopulation, what should you do? Well, a lot of people assume that uh, contraception availability is the main thing, that family planning is the main thing. It is important, but it's not enough by itself. So this is a little graph of increase in contraception availability over a period of about 30, 40 years um, in, uh, in India, and the corresponding reduction in birth rate. You see that there's only a few percent reduction in birth rate even though the rate of contraception availability uh, was multiplied by more than a factor of four. However, if you look at rural versus urban populations, you'll see an enormous difference. So the orange bars are rural populations. The gray bars are urban non-slum areas. So this is people living in cities with jobs. And, uh, and then the the sort of light orange are urban slums. And so you can see that going from uh, rural uh, locations to cities with jobs can cut population growth rates by a factor of two in some places. And education of women is also a huge driving factor. So even if you don't care about the social justice of education with women, just from a purely um, environmental point of view, it's still a huge benefit for a population. You can see that going from uh, no education, the light blue bar, uh, to just primary school education and then secondary school education in green can cut birth rates again by a factor of two, sometimes even a factor of three. So if you want to fix overpopulation, the most important thing is empowerment of women, especially in developing countries. And this can happen through education, economic self-determination, and social or political equality. We'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, and then cities are once again a huge factor, and obviously access to birth control and family planning is, uh, is a required enabler. So those were it for environmental factors. Then. Um, for the, uh, for the remainder of the talk, I'm going to talk about social factors. And social injustice is a combination of these things. And I'm not going to get into all of these in the interest of time, but um, the, the, basically the track here is social injustice is barriers to opportunity in wealth creation, political influence, health, education, and culture or meaning. This doesn't mean that everyone in the world needs to be equally wealthy or equally politically influential, but we need to not have barriers to opportunity there. And so the, the key concept here is the difference between equality and equity. So um, no running track ever uh, that, that you will ever see in any uh, Olympic or even high school uh, or other track and field event is ever built the way that the top track is. Uh, because that is equality. It's having everybody start at the same place, but it fails to take into account the tilt of the playing field, if you will. The fact that these outside lanes are longer 
than the inside lanes. And so that person needs to run farther to get to the finish line. So this is why every track and field meet that you ever see has the starting line staggered because that is equity. It is a fair start for everyone compared to the finish line. And this is a, a hard thing for most of us to notice. It's very hard to recognize your privilege. Uh, there's actually a psychological effect uh, named after this because it's a known uh, factor in psychology. It's called the headwind tailwind effect. We are very conscious of the headwinds, the things that make life hard for us. We don't notice when there aren't problems. And an example for wealth inequality, and again, this is an American example. Um, this is, that's who I usually give these presentations to. Uh, but uh, if you look at what most Americans, the, what the average American thinks is the distribution of wealth in the country, uh, they think that the top 20% most richest uh, Americans own around 60% of the wealth. And then uh, next 20% down to they think the poorest 20% only own about 5% of the wealth. And the average American, again, this is across liberals and conservatives, uh, the average American thinks that wealth should be distributed this way so that the richest 20% of people own about 30 or 35% of the wealth and that the poorest 20% of people own about 10% of the wealth. Well, this is the actual distribution of wealth in America. So what causes this kind of wealth inequality? Um, or, or actually, not just going to causes, but this is uh, go comparing wealth inequality to economic growth. So uh, the blue graph here is over time. This is, it's similar to the previous slide, but it's just looking at the top 1% of richest Americans and the percent of wealth that they own. So back in the 1930s, they owned about 50% of the wealth in America. And uh, that fell through the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and has been rising again ever since. So, so today, it's almost as big as it was during the Great Depression in the 1930s. And... Um, what happened was uh, the way that this came down was heavy taxation. So uh, in the Great Depression, there was, a, there was a New Deal, and then there was World War II, which was actually the greatest redistribution of wealth the world has ever yeah. seen, not just in the U.S., but throughout Europe and Asia as well. And, um, and these massive taxes for the rich, actually the, the top tax rate was over 90% from 1951 to 1963, the sort of golden era of American progress. Um, and you can see that uh, this bottom graph here is growth in GDP. And you'll see that the highest growth rates of GDP happened when wealth was getting redistributed the most, when uh, the richest 1% was having a lower and lower share of the total wealth of the country. And now that it's been going back up, uh, the GDP growth in America has been falling again. And how is wealth distributed? Again, this is uh, American data. Uh, it's very closely tied to race. And so wealth inequality means racial inequality, at least in the U.S. Uh, you can see that white families have about five times, the five to ten times the wealth as African Americans and Latinos. And what's driving that racial wealth gap? Well, uh, almost a third of it is home ownership. So if you want to fix wealth inequality, make it easier for uh, racial minorities to buy homes and then household income, uh, you know, make it easier for them to get jobs and then college education, unemployment, etc. So what are some people doing to improve this? Well, up here is a project that I actually worked on to uh, basically support entrepreneurs in developing countries. It's a cargo-carrying bicycle that was made to be very affordable so that farmers 
and other uh, craftspeople can get their goods to market uh, in an affordable way. Uh, some companies do a uh, donation model. This is a sock company called Bombas, and for every sock that you buy, they actually manufacture two socks. They send one to you, one pair to you, and one pair to people in need, either developing countries or the homeless in the U.S. Uh, down here is a shot from Goodwill. Uh, it's a well-established company. It's a, it's a thrift store in the U.S., and they do a lot of job training, particularly reaching out to minorities to give them job skills so that they can get better jobs uh, at other companies. And then Kiva is a company that does microloans. So they provide loans directly to people, again, often in developing countries that would not normally have access to capital. And then education. What are the biggest barriers to education around the world? The main ones are lack of money, lack of infrastructure, so buildings, books, uh, computers, etc., and skilled teachers. And then gender inequality and other lack of access. So uh, having stuff that's not in your native language or that's not accessible if you are blind or deaf, etc., um, or in places where it's not safe, either war zones or in uh, poor um, communities in, in cities or, or developed countries where there's so much violence due to poverty and, and drugs and things like that that people uh, can't safely go to school. So things that people are doing to fix this are, um, there's a lot of things. There's uh, Donors Choose is a platform that's sort of like Kickstarter for education, but uh, it's a place where teachers post projects that they want funded, and then you or anyone else can go to that website and donate money to that project. You can say, oh yeah, that, that sounds like a really cool project that deserves money. Um, and you can help fix the, the lack of, of wealth or the, uh, the lack of money available for different schools. Um, the one in the upper right is the One Laptop Per Child project. And actually, I put this here as a warning because this is actually a spectacular fail by basically all accounts. Um, it was an MIT professor that basically thought that all you needed to do to fix education in the developing world was to provide laptops to, to people that were affordable and that kids would just teach themselves how to code. And this was a great example of someone not recognizing their own privilege, all the infrastructure and family support and other resources that made it possible for uh, for him to teach himself a lot of stuff and not acknowledging the importance of teachers and communities and infrastructure in education. Um, down here is a company called Little Bits that make uh, educational electronic toys that makes it more accessible and easy and fun to learn. And their specific goal was to make engineering and electronics uh, more accessible to girls. And then finally here, Khan Academy is probably the most famous online education site in the world. It's free to use, and so anyone with a computer and good bandwidth can get hundreds or thousands of lessons on math, physics, uh, biology, engineering, all kinds of stuff from, uh, from middle school level all the way up to um, to college level. And so that was a whole lot of stuff, right? So going back to our original point, if you could invent anything, where would you do the most good? And looking at all these things, both from where the biggest problems are and from where people are creating solutions, I would once again say that the, the top priorities are building uh, dense cities that are also livable, that people want to live in, and that are healthy and, um, uh, and, and culturally life-affirming. Uh, and then fixing buildings, both energy use and resource use, 
and uh, food and agriculture. So that is, again, largely land efficiency as well as uh, pollution and resource use. And transportation of people, again, this is both energy and the resource use of transportation. And electricity generation, empowering women, uh, jobs and wealth, political access, and um, other industries like the chemical industry, paper, concrete, electronics. So um, this, is, this is a list of the biggest areas. And again, you don't have to be in the building industry. You don't need to be an architect to help fix the building industry. You can write software. You can create better interfaces uh, to fix that industry. Again, you don't need to build a better electric car to help transport people. You can build better video conferencing, better file sharing, uh, better collaboration tools so that people don't need to physically move as much. And um, really, if you do anything on this list, uh, don't worry about whether it's number one or number seven or number nine. Uh, if you work on anything on this list, you can make a huge difference in the world. Um, all of these industries are just full of new positive solutions waiting to be born. And that is it for my talk. Uh, thank you very much.